morning, everybody. Welcome back for round number two here in Mundelein, Illinois. I'm Matt Monty. Uh, so a little bit about the results that are going on throughout the uh, throughout the tournament here. Obviously, we only get to watch two matches on our coverage. Uh, most of the time, I don't think we got to a backup that round, but we do have backup matches. Uh, but just kind of looking around, uh, there's a lot of familiar faces in the room, obviously, uh, as we start to build towards the end of the year championship with a lot of familiar faces. Uh, we also have some that we don't see too often on the NRG series. Uh, we have... Uh, Raymond Perez Jr. is in the building. Uh, if you're familiar with with him, as an ex, I believe, Rookie of the Year. Uh, and then Samuel Black is also here, um, obviously doing tons of work uh, on the Pro Tour uh, a while back here. So we got some of those players. Um, you can check out our Twitter also. There's some pictures and things like that, results going up. Now, what I did have some notes here, uh, it was a pretty rough round for some of our top players, actually. Uh, I watched Will Kruger, Mac Endress, uh, and Adam Wasburn Moses all take losses. So a um, lot of points to be made up, obviously, throughout the day, long weekend and things like that. Uh, and we did, I did see, you know, our friend and uh, colleague Joe Lissette took a hard loss in round number one as well after just having a pretty good weekend out at the DreamHack event. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and hop into round number two. Looks like the players are all set. So I'm going to send it back down to those guys and they're going to get us started for round number two. All right. It looks like uh, Gavin going to start us off here on Mono Red Goblins playing Sam Black and Mono White Humans. Battle of the Tribe decks is here is a Den of the Bugbear, Foundry Sheep, Yinzen. And don't get a great look. Looks like Goblin Instigator. Um, goblin Instigator. Sorry. I'm, uh, Drake, I'm sorry. Do you not know me. all the goblins by heart? Not not a goblin player myself, Mason. I wouldn't really call myself too much of a humans player either, but I, I play a lot more of the, the mono white humans deck, I'd say, than uh, the goblins one. This here is a namesake card for Sam Black. Thalia, Guardian of Thraben coming down. Looks like a goblin war chief. Players playing quick magic mm -hmm. here for Gavin. Yeah, we're seeing some turbo magic. I just can't believe they <laughs> tested me on the goblins. That was my interview. Actually, they just said, "Do you have a camera and do you know all the goblins?" And they made me list <laughs> I all would the fail goblins. with flying colors. Wow! <laughs> As Adeline <laughs> enters the mix, uh, any one ones she create pretty well checked by the two two goblin war chief here. Is here's a, another goblin instigator going to assemble quite a battlefield for this goblins deck, mm -hmm. and uh, all of them, I believe, having haste thanks to this um, goblin war chief uh, card. Mm -hmm. Well known throughout Magic as swinging races extremely well. Just being able to give all of your goblins haste as well as produce a mana, making them all cheaper, uh, worth quite a bit here. Mm -hmm. And also, for what's mentioning, I, you know, I think maybe if you watch Magic, you would expect Sam Black to play something a little more off the wall, right, and a little bit more mm -hmm. unique. But Sam, you know, I was talking to them a little bit uh, at the RC, and apparently he has the best results ever with four mutavolts in his deck that he has like won the most money playing that, which is surprising to me. I would not expect that from Sam black, but he is a <laughs> master of these mono white strategies. And it makes sense too, right? Sam black kind of known for one of the world's best drafters and most unique sort of thing. And one of the being, uh, one of the ways that you have to be good at drafting and super important is combat attacking and blocking. And when we're in for a real treat, because watching Sam play this deck, it is unlike anyone else. Absolutely. And and rocking, as you mentioned, uh, one of the most decorated 4X Mutavault players. We see him rocking that this weekend as well. Brutal Cathar took care of that Goblin War Chief. And now this, the first strike, the big toughness on Adeline, all these things worth quite a bit here. I think we see a Chefnet Dunes as well, kind of threatening a little bit of pressure out of Sam's lands. Although both players, you know, I, I don't want to say flooded because they're using their mana every turn. But typically you don't see these decks do as good of a job hitting all of their land drops. Sam here actually on 23. And I think the four mutavolts play a big part in allowing Sam to not just play more lands, have his you know draws be more functional, but also, you know, still get some equity out of it. A seasoned hollow blade is uh, added to the mix as well as here is a big attack from Sam. Adeline resplendent Cathar, Thalia, and it looks like one of the humans made going to make a second one. Fanatical firebrand going to jump in front of the Adeline gonna block, sack, kill the Thalia. Two damage should come across. Another Thalia. And a follow up Thalia for Sam. Legendary does not matter. Gonna have a follow up for it anyway. Sam plays land numbers, or I'm sorry, Gavin plays land number six. And yeah. a quick pass of the turn back. That's not exactly where Gavin wants to be. A flood of mana, the Skirk Prospector, two tokens, two instigators, and a den of the bugbear, six lands, all this mana, nowhere to go with it. Here comes another beatdown attack from the, the flipped Brutal Cathar. 
you know, Adelin, three human tokens now, season hollow blade, Thalia. And like you mentioned, attacking and blocking is very much what this matchup's about, what Sam's about. And uh, he currently says the math is for blockers as here comes the team. Yeah. And we saw, you know, Sam acting in that castle, Ardenvale, even if Gavin has one of his best draws right now, which I'm looking over his deck is maybe something like a, a ringleader type card or something like that. I think there's one of those in the stack. It's still just not enough to overcome this amount of board presence. And we see, yeah, we're going already into game two as Sam Black just has an overwhelming presence on the board. Yeah, and the lands, once, once you mentioned, I mean, that's something that these decks, these aggressive decks do a very good job of leveraging their mana bases. We see very quick match. I think we're going to get to the backup this round. Uh, Sam able to just like, play a constant stream of pressure and then have a big spell follow-up in the form of chef net dunes in his land anthem this entire team these humans all this stuff that he's been producing and use that to overpower the flood of one ones and what have you that gavin put together so extremely mm -hmm. quick magic and sam doing what he does best attacking and blocking 100 percent. so we have a deck list it's acting up a little bit on us here but don't worry drake i've pulled up the deck list and i've kind of got some key stars from both players that we get to talk about here so from gavin here on goblins we have four rending volleys in our sideboards so that's going to be kill anything in sam black stack we're definitely going to see all of those come in and then we have a couple of goblin chain whirlers as well we saw just there how sam had this huge board right but they're all x ones for the most part so that card probably going to come in as well and stabilize things. We even have a couple of experimental frenzies in the sideboard. We have seen some goblin players kind of shift to having just a bunch of removal spells and things like that. And if uh, Gavin wanted to, he could do that with a braid and roast also in the sideboard. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly how much removal Gavin wants to bring in. But for sure has six hard slots coming in with those chain whirls and running volleys. Now over for Sam Black. The kind of the key cards in this matchup when it comes to the sideboard is we have a couple of extraction specialists. This is a good way to kind of fight through rending volley. Ah, so here we actually are getting to pop up. Awesome. Yeah, so you can see this extraction specialist, a great way to fight through rending volley where goblin chain whirler and the lifelink really just matters. And then we also have a couple other sideboard cards. You can get a little interesting on how you want to do it exactly between declaration stone and portable holes. But if uh you know Sam wants to get maybe a little bit more controlling and make sure there aren't any key, too many key creatures at stick, Sam can fight those fights. So traditionally, also something I want to call out here before we get back to the match, uh, in these creature deck on creature deck matchups, especially, you know, revolving around creature types, you know, we see humans versus goblins here. A lot of times, uh, the anthems reign king. And we saw that kind of happen actually in game one with the chef net dudes. Even just a one shot was good enough to overpower the other player. Are you interested in something like wedding announcement to get it uh, flipped into wedding festivity as a way to, you know, push your board over the edge and maybe break up a stalled board or a board you're maybe a little bit behind and uh, bleeding a bit on? Is that something you're interested in doing? You know, I might be, and I, I was about to mention how if you have four of those, that's something I'm maybe a little more interested in because you can actually find it right away. However, right. Sam Black's only playing two this weekend, and it looks like he's playing two Maul the Skyclaves over that as a way to kind of go over the top and fly through and kind of outgrow some of this removal. Um, so we might see wedding announcements still just come in because maybe it's just better in Sam's eye than having something like, you know, one of the three ones, like the Hollow Blade. But I can't imagine we're going to have too too many of these effects but it is an interesting idea and it's something i think when you have four wedding announcements you can more easily rely on because you will see that first wedding announcement in your top couple of cards absolutely makes a lot of sense to me and uh you know i think both players kind of have the option to you know bring as much removal as they kind of want in here and so you need to kind of both players need to figure out exactly how much removal they want in their deck to also still present you know an aggressive get to the board plan you know being able to actually still execute and not have their deck be too diluted we'll see how much removal is is the sweet spot for both those players but have to imagine both players are going to reach for uh at least some of their removal spells and or mm -hmm. you know their board state breakers things like frenzies uh wedding announcements ball of sky clips all that kind of stuff so you, you know i wonder sam might uh might actually change. We're going to throw Gavin's deck list back up here. We got that one working for y'all. You know, I mentioned Gavin does have, if Gavin wants to, basically everything but the unlicensed Hearst, you could argue bringing in this matchup. And if Sam loses to like Experimental Frenzy plus a string of removal spells, we might see him just hard pivot towards those wedding announcements in order to just be like, hey, look, I thought we were playing a more creature based game. Looks like you want to play some Goblin Control. That's cool. <laughs> I'm going to bring in my anti control cards. And in that case, we might actually see the wedding announcement uh, just come in right away. But yeah, this is the Goblin list. It's really exciting. We've seen some interesting results from it on Magic Online and stuff like that. And it presents a very strong practice game as we hop back down to the feature match. Absolutely. And Gavin starting out with a mountain to pass of the turn and a very quick uh, Plains Dauntless Bodyguard for Sam Black. And uh, the new Lord 
uh, put into play Rune by Ball Gavin. We all know yeah, that one, obviously. I know that you know obviously. that, but you were testing me again. I never know how to say run Rundvelt. I'm, I'm very nervous. I can say Horde Master just fine. I'm probably just going to refer to it as that. But Rundvelt is something that is very strange to me as we see a Muta Vault. Red Velvet a... is how I would say it. Say again? Red, red Velvet. Uh, that might red be Velvet. Cool. I yeah. like it. I like yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we got this down. There you go. Get a look mm-hmm. at the Runvelt Horde Master. With as fast as these Magic players are playing, I don't have a ton of time to speculate on these cards, but this one, a pretty good pickup from the new Dominara United set. Uh, there was a whole cycle of these, and the Goblin one appears to be pretty darn good. 100%. And it looks like Sam Black's just curving out along the lines and has another Cathar. And if you look at the hand, we do see Sam Black brought in the wedding announcements. Yeah, nice. And we do see, you know, that, uh, that brutal Cathar able to take care of the goblin war chief exchanging three mana for three mana and uh, that's that's quite a good trade Let's see it was this hopeful initiate gonna get a training counter or i'm sorry did he pay mana for the counter is that how that works whatever creature decks another creature with greater power put a plus one plus one counter on this creature yeah so we, we did get trained by the dauntless bodyguard and uh, has the ability, of course, to remove two counters and destroy an artifact or enchantment. So ironically, you know, you mentioned bringing in Frenzy. This hopeful initiate, not irrelevant when it comes to potentially blowing up an experimental Frenzy. That would be pretty, pretty freaking tough if I'm Gads, if I'm Gavin. And here comes that wedding announcement, which we did see come in. Going to make a 1-1 white human creature token. Dex called humans is going to make humans despite having vampires on it. And... Uh, yeah, it's going to make those on instep. And if you attack two more creatures this turn, that thing's going to flip. Make a lord. As here comes another Goblin War Chief for Gavin and a fire. You know, the interesting thing about Fanatical Firebrand is not only does it get to kill something, but it's going to draw two cards with Horde Master as long as they're goblins. So, you know, Gavin right. here kind of running low on cards. Yeah, they do have to be goblins. Luckily, I don't know if you know this, Drake. Gavin put a lot of goblins in this deck. That's strange that he put goblins in his model red goblins deck. I think that's just good deck building. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> well, we got some good blocks here for Sam. I mean, that Dauntless Bodyguard kind of representing just kind of dying to the fire. Uh, the fanatic. Jeez, I don't even. Fanatical Firebrand. Huh. I, all the Fs gets me, gets me tangled. Uh, kind of representing dying to that anyway, which you do see that exchange happen. And there is uh, a goblin and a rending ball. That's not a goblin, Mason. And, well, uh, unfortunately, we sideboarded non-goblins. We should have got some <laughs> fire in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's close enough. It's close enough. As Battle Cry Goblin, of course, the reveal. Mm-hmm. Going to have access to that one until the end of the next turn. That's a, a, a word that's hard to catch on first read that matters a lot for this card. Yeah, I mean, that attack is just way worse if it's only this turn, right? Like, you're just right. essentially burning all these things. And while you did get a copy of Sam Black's Brave the Elements, which is an important card for if you're able to stabilize, it wouldn't be worth losing out on the draw effect since the game is, you know, pretty far from ending right now. Absolutely. Is this a second copy of winning announcement? How about both? We can do both. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned they're very good in multiples, and you 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 want four, so you draw them. What if you just draw them anyway? Put two in your deck and draw them, Mason. <laughs> I, I hadn't I hadn't considered only putting two and just having them in the top eight cards in my deck. I did not consider that. That that was on me uh, though. That's the moment where that I is need on to you. That's on better. You. Yeah, that's all right. This is why Sam Black is the professional, and we are we are here simply commentating on uh, the masterwork that is Sam Black. Uh, playing wedding announcements. <laughs> yeah, and we see the War Chief here coming in big, making it so that uh, the Taskmaster gets one less mana. Absolutely. Gonna make a Goblin token. Here's a uh, pretty big attack. I mean, these one ones, I mean, they can do some decent trading, but that mostly annihilates all of the action Sam has going on. And, you know, if, with these uh, two Horde Masters now in play, making these ginormous War Chiefs, you know, as big as they are, like, yeah, you can you can trade your tokens off. They're not really worth a ton. Or you can just jump block or whatever. Like, but either way, like, even if you kill a thing, you get two cards for your trouble. If you don't kill a thing, like, you're just going to die to what's on board. And, like, that's really the pressure that we see this Horde match. That's why it's so good. And that's also why they're hanging back and not getting in the red zone. These War Chiefs, expendable. They're just big things. But these Horde Masters are very much what is making Gavin's board as big as it is. And the, the Lords, of course uh like i mentioned are are kind of king when it comes to these uh creature on creature matchups and with both wedding announcements currently on their front half uh sam is down to anthem effects as we see just one chump block made yeah and it's probably sam making some concession to the flipped wedding announcement on the next turn just knows like hey these 
tokens are going to actually trade for real cards. We see Ringleader off the top and hits three goblins. <laughs> Hitting three is the way you want to do it. And I think there's even like another Horde Master to follow up. Uh, I mean, play draw matters a lot in this matchup, but uh, I think no matter what, Sam is in a lot of trouble here. Nothing short of like kind of a wrath of God, I think, is going to get Sam out. We'll see what he's got for us. Looks like Brutal Cathar. It's a start. Yeah, Brutal Cathar take one of the like effects that pump everybody is pretty strong. But yeah, yeah we're going to need something like Brave the Elements into an all-out attack that somehow isn't lethal and the crackback for lethal, I think. I'm not exactly sure. Never mind. I mean, we get uh, one wedding festivities out of our wedding announcement. And that's going to help with making some blocks and or trades this turn. But, I mean, we Gavin just refilled this ringleader. And, I mean, a ringleader has been a good card since, whatever, Onslaught or whatever when it was printed. And we're seeing exactly why right here in modern day in Pioneer. I mean, you know, not only is it hasty pressure, but also... It, you know, is able to just refill these decks that, you know, typically kind of suffer from running out of cards. They don't typically have as much card advantage. They're relying on all their pieces to work together and be worth more than, you know, their individual parts. But, you know, Ringley are kind of able to play both roles. And that is why we've seen that card be so successful in years. And another Anthem effect in the form of Castle Embreth played for Gavin. And we'll see if he's interested in that. No, I'll just take another Ringleader. Thank you. Two mana, thanks to our uh, two War Chiefs. So it's mostly on the house. And, yeah. Wow, Legion Loyalist? <laughs> Legion Loyalist is pretty big. First Strike and Trample is huge. I was going to say, Sam actually has the Bravely Elements in hand. So if Gavin can't set up a lethal attack, we actually have lethal on the next turn. Even if we chop well, block with a couple of I think Legion Loyalist has the text that if you have Battalion, you don't get to block with tokens. You don't get the That's I agree. pretty good yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Sam basically only has two blockers, if so that's the case, and... We had really close to Lethal actually set up a surprising close one, but finding the Loyalist was a huge find off this ringleader. What a wild matchup this is. Where are we at in Pioneer? I mean, look at this. Just like, I'm going to turn my board full of cardboard sideways. Good luck. Here's a Legion Loyalist trigger. We'll see. I, oh, I think Gavin does have to announce the, the Battalion trigger, but uh, no tokens it. don't get to block. Oh, he didn't no, even cast it? We didn't cast it. No, no, no. What? Looks like looks like we don't, <laughs> don't so we need it. Playing Whatever. <laughs> Yeah, and I think... Just everything coming in the red zone. Yeah, it just does not matter. There's like five blockers. I think there's six creatures that go unblocked. It's just yeah. super lethal. You don't even need it. That is... Yeah. Wow. What yeah. a showing from the Goblins deck. <laughs> yeah, a big showing. And also shows kind of like how it's Sam's in this really tricky position when it comes to sideboarding, right? Where, you like you mentioned, you were kind of wanting to play the announcements. And I was mentioning, yeah, if there's a bunch of removal, you want to play those. But those cards really reward you for going long. But the Goblin's deck, if it finds the right parts of its deck, can go longer than you can. So you kind of have to have this perfect recipe of, like, I'm going to pressure you early, chip shot you, and then, boom, stabilize a little bit, brave the elements, win the game. Uh, so it, it's a really hard position to be in as Mata Way, especially when you're on the draw like you were in that game. Absolutely. Play draw matters a ton as far as being able to come out the gate. And I wonder if the players are going to shift their plans as far as removal spells go based on play draw. Because, you know, when you're on the play, you can afford to be more aggressive, start asking the questions instead of providing the answers. Whereas if you're on the draw, you know, you're up a card and you're not really going to have as many opportunities to get to the board and make some favorable exchanges. So you need to have the removal spells to start trading up on mana and, you know, use that to flip the script of the natural turn sequence, you know, when it comes to playing these, these two very aggressive decks against each other. Uh, and uh, like we've seen, I mean, both games have been kind of a blowout with just like the player that was on the play just absolutely running over the other one. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what game three looks like. We'll see if the, the sideboard cards can shift that uh, in any one direction. 100%. Yeah, it's, it's going to be very interesting. And also, it makes me wonder if Sam is by default maybe the aggressor in this matchup more so than trying to do anything just because Sam just... It's so hard to compete with things like Ringleader or the Horde Master Trigger if you get a couple trades going off. That just pulls you so far ahead. And in any game where, as long as it doesn't hit something like Rending Ball off the Horde Master, if you hit a bunch of lands, that normally is not going to matter in the same sort of way, and you're kind of getting closer to that gas. And with both decks not having any form of like real hard card advantage outside of something like Ring Ringleader or Horde Master, those forms of card advantage are going to matter a lot when the board gets stalled. 
Absolutely. And we, we, we've seen, I mean, we called it out a few times where Sam gets a lot of equity out of his lands and things like that. The Goblins deck gets to not just do that, but has a lot of baked in card advantage alongside ringleaders, horde masters, which were kind of the unsung heroes of that game. You know, just keeping the flow of cards going, digging uh, Gavin closer to all of his, you know, impactful pieces, things like war chiefs and stuff like that, that actually did the beating down and winning of the game. Uh, that card advantage engine set up between those two cards to just keep the flow of cards coming, even if you're making trades or, or whatever, uh, it was a big part of that. And I, I think that that definitely speaks a lot to your assessment that Sam probably has to be the aggressor in this matchup because the, the humans deck doesn't really have things like that. You know, they have card advantage, they have access to uh, things like Adeline and stuff like that. They can put some humans in play, things like you're, you know, getting your Muta Vaults and your Chef Net doings, getting more equity out of your lands. But the Goblins deck just goes so far beyond that, just goes over the top. They get to do some of that and and more with things like Ring Leaders and stuff like that. So Sam kind of needing to have more games like we saw in game number one, which, you know, he's set up to do being on the play. 100%, yeah. So you may be interested to see. It looks like both players are just about to finish up sideboarding, but it does look like they did sideboard some. So I'm curious, maybe Sam changed you know, the kind of the cards he was playing after seeing how those games played out, maybe the same for Gavin here. It's going to be really interesting to see as we are now back in the future match area. Absolutely. And once again, quick magic is here is a planes and hopeful initiate played for Sam and Legion loyalist there on turn one can't attack because I believe hopeful initiate one, two, a Legion mm -hmm. loyalist a one, one. So despite having haste, that one's going to stay back. As here comes second land for Sam Black. Second hopeful initiate. All right. Well, we'll serve with one. There you go. Take a point. Bang. Winning. As we pass back to Gavin. Yeah, and we're, you know, we see Sam has something like Adeline in hand. So the, the pressure is really going to start. And it looks like Gavin just had nothing on two. If you're Sam, are you like like red alert, red alert, not something like running volley here? Or do you think? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it I is. think you have to be heads up to removal spells. Uh, there's not that many one drop goblins. So, you know, even it could be something like a rending volley, which we saw in game number two. So, you maybe don't want to deploy your best thing. But, you know, Sam, Sam's hand might just be action anyway. It just doesn't matter. As here comes a rending volley on Adeline, which was what Sam chose to play. Two hopeful initiates going to continue to serve. Going to stay one twos, though, as none of them have more power. Though the Muta Vault played there for Sam could represent to grow both of those things. As here's a goblin war chief played on turn three for Gavin. Now that we don't need to hold mana up for Rending Volley, let's go ahead and get our War Chief in play. Looks good all three games. That one's going to stay back, threaten to block our one twos as we see the one mana removal spell played on Edelin the, the previous turn. Very good, Edelin. A lot of toughness. Rending Volley, don't care. <laughs> 100%. And we see, you know, Sam here, like, look, I've got some Muta Vaults. I'm willing to trade. Let's rumble. Absolutely. I mean, trading your Muta Vault for the War Chief, you know, kind of sucks to fall behind on mana. Sam does have another copy of Muta Vault, though, and does get to grow these Hopeful Initiates, which is the big play there. Now that those are two threes, that's, that's worth quite a bit, as Dauntless Bodyguard is the follow-up. Sam kind of running low on action, though. Looks like his hand may be a little unexciting. And now this is the spot where Gavin needs to have some of those powerful Goblin payoff pieces like we saw in game number two in order to help catch him up. And there is Chain Whirler. That's a little late to the party as far as picking up one ones, but it's still going to get a, a Dauntless Bodyguard and represent a 3 3 first strike, which does stifle the hopeful initiate attacks for now. But Sam can pay some mana. Yeah, it's so and... awkward where Sam was trying to initiate this race, and Gavin's like, no, I'm the defender this game. And the way that we right. didn't see from Gavin in game two were with one. And three mana. Looks like a. Th Folly is Lieutenant. Oh, we animated the Muta Vault so that that one gets a counter as well. And now we have two three fours and the Goblin Chain Willer that looks like to be a very good blocker in a three three first strike suddenly looks way worse in the face of two three fours that are going to continue to rumble along and put Gavin down to seven. Yep. And, and we're seeing the Chain Willer. And we're seeing just the power of the mono white human stack. You know, it doesn't have hard lords like we saw from Horde Master from the Goblin stack this round, but it does have these sort of explosive draws they can get. And really get under even you know these other aggro decks and sort of outscale them very quickly. And the power stays around even if you know the lord dies, which is a pretty big thing when you're playing against cards like Rending Volley from the other side. Absolutely, and yeah, that's something I wanted to call it. Even if we saw like another chain wheel or something to pick off the Thali's lieutenant. That power stays back. You know, we still have that power uh, on our hopeful initiates, which are you know kind of the workhorses of this game at the moment. Now, Drake, I know you know this goblin. I don't know this goblin. You got you do, me. The hobgoblin. <laughs> You don't know the hobgoblin? Don't know the hobgoblin. Wait on me. Uh, the hobgoblin bandit lord. It's a lord, as the name would say. It's a 2-3, and you can actually red tap it, and then it deals damage equal to the number of goblins you control. 
to a creature. So this is actually one of the ways that uh, Gavin might be able to stabilize here if he can build up enough chump blockers and start shooting down Sam's board. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a really game-breaking one in this matchup. Only two copies in the main deck. Uh, a little Lord here, a rare from Adventures in the Forgotten Realm card that, you know, people at home may not have known. I certainly didn't. I'm, you know, not ashamed to admit that, but <laughs> represents quite a powerful engine here if Gavin can live through the turn, which based on a second copy of Thalia's Lieutenant and this Mutavolt being fired up is uh, not a given, as Sam is quickly doing the math as he does best. Uh, math maybe not always for blockers as Sam is lining up some attacks here, seeing what the blocks look like. The, a 4-4 first strike in the form of Goblin Chain Wheeler worth quite a bit on the blocking side, but those hopeful initiates being now four fives is worth quite a bit still in the face of that, as here comes the team. Yeah, and Sam's basically forcing Gavin to this spot where can't get any profitable trades without getting dangerously low on life, but also if you just chump block everything, you're still really low and falling really far behind. So we're probably going to end up seeing here is that Gavin's going to kill one of the creatures and then lose the whole board. <laughs> you sound so excited about it. I mean, we got a couple <laughs> good blocks, right? We have this. Thali's Lieutenant can be blocked by the, what is it, 2-3 the go Goblin. We see this. Actually, that's not even that good of a block. All right, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. my blocks suck. We have Chain Wheeler that can at least first strike one of these, but that's about all you get out of the deal. And yeah. this Legion Low List definitely chumping. Yeah, and you kind of have to do this, which is like the the good part about same attack with the awkward if you're a Gavin fan. Where it's just like, oh yeah, my blocks are basically four. Somehow these hopeful initiates are four fives. They've just grown and grown and grown this game. And shows how strong they are too. Having that one two body was pivotal to surviving things like the early chain whirler. Absolutely. There is a goblin instigator. That one I'm gonna bring along some chum blocking help, but really, once again, you, you kind of just want the lords. So like this is very much this game is about the lords and sam having drawn two of them in the form of thaw's lieutenant to gavin's only one copy in the form of the hobgoblin and uh yeah that's just not going to be good enough to get the job done and sam black gonna win a quick series here all three games uh were played and still it felt like a blistering pace between these two extremely aggressive tribal decks and humans gonna win the day for sam black as he advances to two and oh a hundred percent. Yeah. And you know, we saw their brave, the elements is just one of those things where that's a real strength, of this mono white deck you get in the ship shots. And even if uh, Gavin had stabilized, right. And had got the hop goblin going, well, brave, the elements are just going to push through and you get your point down to five, six life. It's so easy just to finish them off. And brave, the elements almost plays like this split protection card slash, you know, lava ax. And in these matchups, very, very important and gives mono white the edge and all the mono sort of mirrors. Absolutely. And, we are going to have I'm a backup feature sure. match this round. Uh, I don't know if we're going to interview Sam. I think we're still going to figure it out. But, Drake, how do you like this Mono White deck? Because I really like it. I think it's one of the, you know, the decks that is got a real sort of future for it in Pioneer, but isn't super strong in a lot of ways. It's just very consistent and very good, if that makes sense. That makes sense. I, I, I'm willing to go on record with Thalia Guardian of Thraven as one of my least favorite magic cards ever printed. <laughs> so if that tells you where I'm at on the Mono White Humans, Okay, and uh, yeah, I'm a big Thalia fan, but you know, I won't Ugh. say that in public too much. Just you, me, and 400 of the closest <laughs> friends. Gotta right hide now. it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Thalia's Lieutenant, though, I feel like that card is just so good and continues to scale so well in Pioneer. And we just saw in that game just how backbreaking it was. Absolutely. Well, I think we have a backup match. This one, a little bit more my speed as we get to see a little bit mm -hmm. more. Yeah, we, what, what, what's the little sneak preview oh, of the backup okay. match? Sam Black is going to come in, and we're going to talk to him for a second. We are it's such a great opportunity. You never get to talk to people like Sam. Uh, you know, S Sam, close by, but, you know, can't always make it out to our circuit events. And when he does, he always does really well. And Sam Black has such a great mind for the game. It's really cool to get to talk to Sam and kind of see his way of thinking about stuff. Very interested. You know, he has a podcast like Drafting Archetypes where he talks about stuff. So it's very exciting. And I'm really excited to see kind of what his opinion and thoughts are on Pioneer and Modern. Uh, and so, I don't know, Drake, how excited are you to talk about Sam? <laughs> Very excited. I, I don't get a lot of opportunities uh, to, to, to talk with Sam Black, and uh, I think definitely not about things other than limited. So let's, uh, let's, go, let's go have some words with him. I'm very excited to hear his thoughts on the Pioneer format. Sam, hey. thanks for joining us here today in the booth. Congratulations on your round two win. Thanks. H how are you feeling about pioneer right now i know that you played mono white in the rc last weekend and you had a pretty solid finish all things considered but how do you feel about it right now and everything you know a week later and kind of seeing all the results uh i mean i think that 
Pioneer does a really good job of like having a really diverse format where there are like a lot, like countless viable decks, and players can kind of play like any deck and any strategy that they want and play like pretty close matches against a really wide variety of opponents, which I think is kind of the most important aspect of an eternal format in terms of like you know the format doesn't rotate so to keep things like interesting you need to have a wide variety of experiences which like uh having a really diverse metagame offers um i personally don't love all the game gameplay in pioneer i feel like there are a really large portion of available matchups where the die roll is really important um a lot of the decks are kind of forced to be pretty like fast and linear um but I mean, it's still magic, so you still play some sweet games. Mm -hmm. Now, is is mono white your favorite deck in the format, or is it just like the the deck that you kind of you know turn to and stuff like? Because I see some pretty inter interesting innovations in your deck with things like Skull. I'm oh, sorry, Maul the Skyclave, uh, which is not a card that I feel like is super typical for the mono white sideboards. Yeah. So um, the bigger change, like the thing that is unusual about my deck compared to other white decks, is I have removed the standard for. Uh, Luminarch Aspirants from the main and replaced them with uh, like a mix of Seasoned Hollow Blades and Guardian of New Banalia and Tomic and stuff. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that uh, there's a lot of removal and Luminarch Aspirants not great at staying alive. And uh, I didn't love the Gruel Vehicles matchup. Um, and I think that putting them all the Skyclave on a creature that can become indestructible is a really good plan against them. Uh, ben Stark turned me on to that one. And um, I uh, didn't feel like I was sacrificing a lot in other places because like, there are a lot of other removal heavy decks where just having a resilient two drops is pretty nice. Absolutely. And this is this is a format you mentioned dedicated a lot by play draw. Uh, does that influence your your deck your deck selection process? So like you're somebody that plays a lot of limited, right? A lot of attacking blocking going on there. Play draw obviously matters a fair bit as well. Um, you know, you chose mono white this weekend in <clears throat> a format kind of dominated, like you mentioned, by removal spells. So like the face up level one is that removal spells should be good against the aggro deck. If you you know selected mono white. You made some adjustments that seem to be good against removal. Your thoughts are now that you are good against these decks that play a lot of removal spells? Yeah, I mean, so before playing in the RC, I was kind of worried about, like, Rakdos on paper. Like, they have a lot of removal spells. I'm a creature deck. But uh, I beat R Rakdos three times in the RC. It didn't seem very close. Uh, like, removal spells are strong because uh, they trade up on mana against creatures. But in the Rakdos versus White matchup, that's not what happens because your creatures cost less than their removal spells and Thalia taxes their removal spells. And so it's like actually really hard for them to like come back from the tempo deficit that you playing one drops puts them at. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense to me. And, uh, you know, definitely an impressive showing, even in the, uh, the games we watched where some removal spells were involved. I uh, I think your your deck still presented very overwhelming overwhelming power in both uh, both of the games that you you were victorious in. That was it was really cool to watch. Seems like it's very very potent and uh, excited to watch you play more. Yeah, thanks. Well, Sam, thank you so much for taking some time, stepping in the booth and talking to us. It was great to get to talk to you. Go enjoy yourself before your next round. Hopefully, we'll be seeing more of you throughout the day. We've got some cool decks to come show the viewers, so we're gonna hop back in the booth and go do that. But That's thank good. you once again for having the interview. Yeah, no problem. All right. Great to have Sam there and such an you know, such a great mind for the game too. And really you get you kinda of get the feeling, right? When you talk to someone like that, Drake, where it's like, oh, they really get magic. You know, players might be like, Yeah, my Thalia lines up pretty well against the removal, blah, blah, blah. But you see how Sam's just default reaction to think about and talk about magic is like, well, magic's a game of mana, you know we're trading profitably on mana. So while I am down cards, I'm actually able to benefit from this mana exchange and close that gap, even though I'm down on cards in this exchange. Or, you know, they're good against my cards. And that sort of difference is very big. So let's go to break for one second, and then we'll get more future match area for you. Oh, future, straight to the future match. Straight Never to the mind. future match. No, wait. No, wait, Mason. <laughs> no I, worries. I, we are... I, I'm so this. greedy. I I thought that I had to, you know, calm it down a little bit before we go to the future match here, but I just could have no. all the magic all the time. That's Straight so exciting. In. We see Chris Smith versus David Delgado. 
playing is it phoenix versus soul tie combo let's have a look at what this uh what this combo actually is so keenan's this is a uh our own jesse robkin and uh ashlyn johnson uh shut mtg on twitter they came up with this deck in our testing group and chris uh loved it and kind of picked up and ran with it they call it dungeons and druids uh but basically drake what the plan is is you're trying to get gwenna eye of gaia onto the battlefield and this is a new elf from uh i don't need to tell you this card i know it's a commander card you love i actually do know this card yeah it's a commander card i know this one yeah so you get you get you get gwenna down and then you play arrakis the arch lich which is the one of the cards lets you venture through the dungeon and if you have a Kinnon or a Flip Duskwatch Recruiter, that's game. You just drain your opponent infinitely. And then your deck tries I to play see. like a fair mid rangey plan while doing that sort of thing. And uh, I knew Chris was a big fan of this deck when I saw it. And it looks like Chris has done some interesting work to try and, you know, let the deck have multiple angles, not just so all in on the combo. Yeah, Chris missed someone, you know, won one of our trials with uh, Yawgmoth earlier this year. So black and green combo decks seem to very much be Chris's speed. Get blue for your trouble as well. We'll see how it fares against a removal dense deck like Is It Phoenix as we see a turn one elf, you know, a pretty notable play here in this format played for Chris Smith. Prosperous Innkeeper appears to be the follow up. Two Spider Buff Canals and a removal spell played for David Delgado. Consider as well. Looks like a handful of spells though uh, for David, but not a lot of threats not a lot of action to follow up is spikefield hazard gonna take care of that that innkeeper yeah and you can even tell from david's side right like with the phoenix deck you kind of have to sculpt your games like we talked about in round one with jesse's match and how you kind of have to play sort of certain things but there's no chance that i would imagine david knows what chris is doing and seeing something like process innkeeper really makes you go like okay am i even supposed to spikefield hazard this it seems like i am but am i yeah, absolutely. A lot of times, Prosperous Innkeeper, we saw that play a lot of, uh, play a lot in standard with like sacrifice decks and stuff like that, which is very much not what is going on here. So, well, it's interesting to see how David will navigate as he kind of discovers what this deck's about. This is one of my favorite things about non open deckless tournaments is you have this sub game being played here by David as he, you know, resolves his cantrips, has to make these decisions about what cards he wants, what cards he doesn't, but doesn't really actually know the entirety of what's going on on the opponent's side of the field. As Relic of Legends, uh, a commander card, Mason, is going to be a reader here for David Delgado. That one lets you tap and untap legendary creature, makes let your Acerac actually make mana when you uh, put it into play. And uh, before it gets returned to hand. So that's a, that's a pretty good one for kind of doing the the same thing as a flipped Duskwatch Recruiter or um, mm -hmm. a Kinnon as well. As well as just makes mana. Just a great card for this combo deck. Yeah, it, this is a card that when it got previewed, a lot of players were like, okay, how do we break this? This is a card that looks like it could be broken. And honestly, so far, this seems like the best use of it I've seen in Pioneer. Getting the uh, the Arch Lich ability to work and like come down and tap it and have it bounce and make it so it's just two mana is actually pretty important and we see chris is doing stuff like playing bantu's monument as well to make everything cost less so <laughs> we might just see chris be like venture through the dungeon a little bit while trying to find the right stuff and just generate some you know minute advantages now i know you know all the dungeons by heart so we only even not talk about dungeons you got me on that one uh, okay. <laughs> i know there's a dungeon that kills that's what i got sure. <laughs> that's what i am sure 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 don't worry that's the one everyone goes through every time anyways it like draws cards it makes goblets we'll talk about when the time yeah, comes bro. as we see i think a thing in the ice here yeah we saw we saw last turn we saw treasure cruise tap all the giant giants and a thing in the ice and the follow-up here on this turn we're going to get things started with a piece of the puzzle that's going to hit two arc light phoenixes that is uh what the doctor ordered i think a one man a cantrip to boot i think we see flushed full of spells is david delgado's hands so those phoenixes Fairly likely to come back if David wants this turn, although that would involve putting the thing in the ice potentially only to one counter. So any spell played after that would return them to hand. So that's kind of like the, you can call it maybe awkwardness uh, with thing in the ice alongside Phoenixes. If you don't have any kind of looting effects or ways to get them back in the graveyard once they hit your hand again, it can be kind of bad. But uh, thing in the ice is big enough that it's usually worth it to get your 7-8 uh, your uh, activated and ready to go as consider going to be played here again as well also with the Four thing cards. on the ice too for what it's like mentioning it's kind of really good against chris's deck where even though you can't play spells it's like well i have a clock on you you have to have multiple creatures in play to do your combo what are you going to do batman riddle me this you know and so right. for, from chris's perspective it's almost like no wait cast more spells please you know <laughs> <laughs> well, for uh, the whole combo to work, you need either a non-summing set Gwenna, but I guess, I think you can make it work with, like, 
Relic of Legends, like the Bontus monuments, you could just make Acer at cost one with like all of those effects. And then you could just do it right away without any kind of Gwena stuff, right? Because the Acer yeah. makes mana with Relic of the Legends, comes back to hand, costs one each time, so it pays for itself. And you're uh, you're good to go there. Yes, we but we need to Let's find it quickly yeah. because we got a bunch of Arclight Phoenix attacking us, which which is the same, <laughs> you know? Like, like uh, give enough time, Chris's deck could beat anyone, I'm sure, but you don't always have the time in Pioneer. Absolutely not. And that's something Sam was just talking about in that interview is uh, formats a lot about play draw, you know, beat down matters a lot. And uh, David has presented quite a bit of said beat down as a very quick game. Number one going to be won by David Delgado getting one more read of Relic of Legends, a very sweet one mm-hmm. uh, before we go ahead and start sideboarding. So uh, yeah. And you yeah. know, probably what's happening there is uh, David is like, I want to read that real quick because I've got these abrades and these brothers in as we're about to check out the cyborg team, the second bridge player. I want to make sure, is this a card that really matters? I got to do some reading real quick. Uh, because as we'll see in a second, David has a lot of shatter effects on the sideboard. So if that thing matters, it probably going to have a hard time sticking around. <laughs> it ain't staying in play. Yeah. It's got to go. Yeah, if you're Chris, you almost want to ask like, no, you can't read it. Call a judge for you. Like, get, get, get something. Or whatever. Make, yeah, yeah, make somebody else call it. <laughs> Figure this out. But we do oh, see here good. from David Cyborg, we have three brothers in, three Impalable Alliance, two Aethergust, two Stroke, two Mystical Dispute, a Obliterating Bolt, and then a Gate. These Brotherhoods in not only stop the artifact part of our combo, but kill, I believe, every creature in the deck, including the side. No, seems, everyone but like one. Card. Yeah. <laughs> that seems like what I'd want in my deck. Yeah, I... I'm not gonna lie, this seems like a really hard place to be. I do want to shout out David Delgado's uh, improbable alliances in the sideboard. If you squint, it looks like Bitter Blossom, a very interesting and smart tech against something like Rakdos Midrange. Absolutely. Love that card a lot. Tried to play a lot with it in standard. Big fan of that card in the in this Phoenix sideboard here against a very Rakdos heavy kind of metagame where uh, you need to be able to grind out the opponents and that, that that's one that can't hit enchantments. So like you said, Brothers at End, Brotherhood's End, uh, pretty interesting pickup for David Delgado. Maybe he's interested in the Aether Gusts as well to handle some of the green creatures, but I'm not even sure he saw too many of those to where he wants those. So I'm probably only bringing in Brothers at End and shipping it based on what we saw there in game one, unless David Delgado has uh, even more information than we thought. Uh, not a lot of adjustments to be made and maybe he doesn't need them based on how game one played out. Yeah, I think this matchup looks like to be a nightmare matchup in the same way Rakdos probably is for this deck, where if you're trying to play like a solitaire race sort of strategy, if you're on the play, you could probably race most people with your like even your medium draws, whereas this deck breaks you up and then still clocks you. And so Chris's deck here, we can take a quick look at real quick uh, right before we start game two. Uh, Chris's sideboard is pretty interesting. So we have three Fatal Push, three Thoughtseize, two Shaper Sanctuary, two Skylasher, two Hearse. One Elder Gargaroth, one Carnage Tyrant, one Coma, Cosmos Serpent. I imagine we're going to see things like Thoughtseize and Shaper Sanctuary come in as a way to pick apart the smart removal and fight through it. But, Drake, do you think something like Carnage Tyrant's coming in in this matchup? It feels like a card for Red Black, but maybe it's good enough here? I'm in. Any removal spell matchups, I want the big chonkers. Give me Elder Gargaroth, give me Carnage Tyrant. Hell, I'll take the Coma, too. I want to be able to put these large creatures in play that invalidate a lot of the cheap removal that is very good against your deck in Game 1. Trim on some of the things that just are lightning rods and, you know, kind of go from there. Maybe the Gwena thing you can get off entirely or whatever. You know, I don't, I don't know that you can actually do that, but I want to get away from a lot of the creatures that die to Fiery Impulse and put things that don't die to removal at all in the deck. And, you know, like you said, bring in some Thoughtseize and stuff like that in order to kind of take more of a controlling role. Play Actually, it's truthfully more of a mid-range deck where you answer a few of the things the Phoenix deck has going on, play a big threat that can't be killed, and win the game in that strategy. That's, I think, how I want to adjust as we see what Chris is working with here in game number two on the play this time. So there's no thank you on that hand. A little mulligan. It looks like David also took a mulligan to six and bottom one. And yeah, Absolutely. I'm going to be interested to see it. You know, Chris's deck is built around one of the strongest cores in Pioneer, which is eight elves. If you have eight elves, your deck is often pretty strong, especially on the play. Absolutely. And I mean, that's that was the, the big draw to the Mono Green, right? When people were parroting how much Mono Green's great in this format, which we may see changing here a little bit, both in the RCs and in our tournament. You know, we talked to Sam Black. He, he's not playing Mono Green. Um, you know, we saw a lot of the, the argument for that deck being the best was just being able to play eight elves, being able to get ahead on mana and start having some of these snowball-y plays that, you know, is involved in a lot of these cards that are available to you in Pioneer and just get, get the ball rolled and just be able to kind of blow the doors off your opponent. And, 
you know, Chris Smith does have access to that, but the Phoenix deck is as good as it is because it's actually pretty good at checking that too. Okay, you can have your eight elves. I have eight one banner removal spells, and that is kind of the the way that the Phoenix deck is trying to line all this stuff up. Is mm-hmm. looks like we have a card bottomed and we are ready to start playing magic. Botanical Sanctum at a pass of the turn. Spire Bluff Canal, see your fast land, answer you a fast land, pass of the turn back. And another botanical sanctum, prosperous innkeeper. And you see, once again, David has to read this card. I think David's trying to figure out. David has to know there's some sort of combo thing going on, right? Like you saw the relic, you see this innkeeper, you saw the elves. I don't know if David knows this combo, but from David's side, it's like, do I have to kill this? Is this going to like gain infinite life or something? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't imagine he knows what's going on quite yet. Prosperous Innkeeper, kind of innocuous because the mana gets to, to stay around, so it's only really a 1-1 one, one in play. And with David, looks like only really has access to one removal spell right now. Can't be super interested in firing that one off on something that's lower quality like a Prosperous Innkeeper. Chris, four mana up, maybe representing something like a collected company. Plays a Botanical Sanctum, passes the turn. And we have an in-step consider. Nice. Yeah, and, you know, David... I. I know I keep mentioning it, and it feels like I'm kind of like maybe joking around or something like that. If I was David, a lot of my brain power would be thinking about what on earth can my opponent be doing with these cards? Because absolutely, I mean, and it's one of those things that's so easy to be in magic where it's just like, I don't know, my opponent's doing something silly. It's like, no, my opponent went and played this tournament. I probably see Chris from the, you know, the banners were watching coverage. We know Chris is someone who is, you know, made a run in our leaderboard, has won and top eight in multiple of these tournaments, isn't someone who's slouching run one round one, right? So clearly they have thoughts and plans. So what am I trying to do to like beat these plans and what on earth could they be doing? We see a Shaper Sanctuary going to go ahead and draw out that fiery impulse. Uh, David says, well, I, I definitely don't want you drawing cards if I have to use this removal spell. So we're going to go ahead and fire that off. And the follow-up, Lanavar Elves. For Chris Smith. So now this one, you know, not necessarily only the lightning rod. The Shaper Sanctuary threatening to uh, get a card back for your trouble uh, out of that one. But Chris also mostly out of cards in hand. You know, after land return, we're looking at only one card left in hand from what it looks like. And David still quite a few resources to work with. And I think we saw pieces of the puzzle among the mix as well. So even if he begins to run low, you know, the Phoenix deck doing what the Phoenix deck does best. He's going to have access to uh, you know plenty more resources to refill. As, you know, kind of taking this blue-red control role. No threat in play for David quite yet. Yeah, but and not I, a whole lot going on for Chris either. I think one of the things, a, a criticism I had of Jesse and Ash's version of this deck at the beginning, which I think Chris has done a little bit to help improve, is that Shaper Sanctuary isn't very good. Because what it really <laughs> says is, okay, kill the creature that makes my deck work. I'll draw a card in response to that, which is fine. But you need to have other things that are going to force the game to be about that to make Shaper Sanctuary actually into a card. Because if I had to choose between losing the game and letting you draw a card, you know, despite my instincts to never let my opponent draw a card, I'm going to just kill your thing and let you draw a card. And you only have so many cards that matter in this deck. So I like Chris's move towards things like you mentioned, Karn, Shiren, Coma, uh, Elder Gargaroth, to have more things that you must kill. Absolutely. And here looks like a collected company being cast. I have to imagine this is on instep because this, I believe we're seeing a connive here. This ledger shredder entered play and then we went for an instep collected company, Aether Gust, which we did bring in, went ahead and tagged that collected company potentially. No, it, it tagged the Shaper Sanctuary. It tagged the Shaper Sanctuary. Yeah, David okay. was using Sorry, the company. The point there. No, you're good. You're all good. I think it's a really interesting play too because if, if your hand's really heavy on spot removal and you're not quite sure what's going on, tagging the Shaper Sanctuary there just removes it, right? Like, Chris has to bottom it. What are you going to do? Put it on top and let your company resolve and only see five cards? Like, come on. Yeah, no, you definitely have to bottom that one. It's going to go to the bottom either way. You don't want it as one of your options. Looks like Acerac and Keenan, uh, the cards chosen. Don't get a great look at the dungeon he chose. So now is a I, great time to educate me on the dungeons. I believe that it is Lost Mind of Fandelver is the one we have gone into. Uh, we can get that pulled up on coverage here in a second. I believe the first version of that is Scry, and then the next one is you either get a treasure or make a goblin. And then depending on where you go from there, depends on like the, the tree of abilities. Um, but yeah, here you go. So you can make a treasure or a minus one, minus one, I think. Uh, or sorry, it's, it's create a goblin. My bad. I misread the card there for a second. Yeah. And we're probably going to see him just go through this one a bunch uh, because this is also the dungeon that wins the game. So if you go through the dark pool, the dark pool there in the middle, you drain life, and this one ends with drawing a card. So this is kind of your all-around dungeon, the middle of the three, but this okay. happens to be the best one in the stack. Sure. Yeah. Well, either way. 
And we're going to see looks... the Acerac go back to hand. A hundred percent. Um, and I think it looks like we're activating Kinnon's activated ability to in order to look at the top seven cards and putting non-human thing in the play. We hit, we hit Gorklaw. That's that's another great commander card. At four mana, four three, makes your creatures that have four or more power cost two less to cast. And I think it draws a card. No, it gets bigger. That's right. When whenever it attacks each uh, creature you control, power four greater gets a little little anthem, little bump, make your big stuff bigger, and gets trample. That's the big one. Getting trample. Look at that. And that does, you know, of course, make Acerac Acerac believe like five five makes mm -hmm. uh, Acerac cheaper to cast. Helps gets the thing going. So all we need now is Relic of Legends or Gwenna, and I think we have a check mark. So very, very close to winning is Chris Smith, but given that we have nothing else I think we can do this turn, we are probably going to have to give David another turn. Yeah, it looks like the choke point here is black, black mana for Chris, as he has so much green mm -hmm. mana. But yeah, you know, we, we're going to get multiple activations of the Arch Lich here, and I don't know what's going to go on here. Quick quick uh, CDH side point. Is this Bayer good in CDH? Is this a CDH no. card? Okay, well. could it, could it A good it? heuristic is if, if you play CDH uh, it, and you're asking if a green card's good, the answer is probably no. The, the green is wow. the worst color in CDH despite being the best color in regular EDH. Wow, fascinating. Back to the game. <laughs> 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 David here though does have lightning axe, which is just gonna demolish this bear, I think. Yeah, the, the lightning axe, this is the problem with having to pass the turn, right? Like the the draw to doing this combo, especially in the postboard matchups against Phoenix, is you want it, you want the cards that let you do it all one turn. You don't need to wait a turn, you don't need a creature to stick around and play. Because if there's one thing Phoenix is very good at, it's getting creatures off the board. That's something that, you know, like, once again, Sam Black mentioned, that's what this format's about. That is what this format's about. You know, putting objects in play and answering the objects in play. And Phoenix is a good deck because it's good at answering the objects in play. As I think we see a spike field hazard pick off land or elves, that's step one. You know, we're going to see treasure cruise, step two. That's a great way to do it. Going to go ahead and get a connive. Yeah, and this connive is really important. You know, we're running kind of low on things that actually kill stuff. We're really hoping treasure cruise finds it. Um but you'll also kind of find some pressure so you can actually win this game. So I think David gets it now. I don't have infinite time. Yeah, I think I think now he kind of gets the joke. Okay, we're doing the Acerac thing a lot. And I, if he remembers Relic of Legends and the text on that, I think he's figured it all out. And uh, I, I mean, Lightning could just answer the Relic of Legends, but uh, how about we just kill all of your creatures? Here's Brotherhood's End that will take care of both the Gore Claw and the Keenan. Five, uh, sorry, six mana worth of cards in exchange for three. That's uh, the way to do it. And here's a Smackdown for three. I bet you Chris can't guess what David drew off the treasure cruise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the spike field hazard does look a little suspicious if the Brotherhood's End was already in hand. So that one, of course, drawn off of the treasure cruise. We call that a moral victory. You lose all your creatures, you're like, yeah, but I know one of the three cards you drew. <laughs> 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 I have some extra information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, well Chris here. So what Chris could assemble? I think he's just casting Acerac to venture into the dungeon some more. Well, we're pretty close to completing this dungeon. It looks like. I mean, four counters on it, right? That's that's pretty close. Yeah, we're gonna get to draw a card, and then we get to start all over again. Nice. Yeah. That's power. It's. It, it, it is awkward it can't with be. the letters. It's really good when you do it infinitely. It's very powerful there. Yeah. Yeah, if that's all you're doing, it's actually the best. Uh, just you kind of have to be doing it all in that same turn. Absolutely. As we do see Acerac happen here. And I think, let's see, what is happening? I, I believe uh, we've hit some part of the the thing where you like reveal the top two and put one into play. Sure. I, that seems very powerful. I'm not actually sure. I don't remember all the parts of the Lost Mine of Fandelver. Is this even Lost Mine of Fandelver? Yeah, I don't remember. It, it might not be. Maybe it's the Wizards one. There's like a... I thought... Oh, you know what? We didn't make a treasure or a goblin. So we're probably in the, the wizarding one. We're definitely not in the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Island. We just hit the Runestone Caverns of Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Actually, the top two cards of your library, you may play one of them. And I believe we chose to play the Keenan. So next mode is Scry Three. Yeah, it's going to be pretty powerful. And the, the last one like draws three cards. So you know that's that's a pretty good that's a pretty good effect. This is like his own treasure cruise. Yeah, 
Exactly. And you know David Elgato doesn't know any of those modes. <laughs> I, just, I, I didn't. So, like, this is something that only comes up in this deck specifically, which, as you mentioned, is kind of a rogue deck. Uh, but some cool stuff going on here. I mean, the life gain kind of mattered a little bit here with uh, pressure being laid down by the Phoenix deck. And, uh, you know, we saw some scrying action, see some uh, you know, card advantage with the Runestone Cavern. So a lot of cool stuff going on here with this Dungeon of the Mad Mage we appear to be venturing through as Ops number two going to go ahead and allow us to connive on this Ledger Shredder. I believe we discarded an extra copy to go ahead and grow it. Now a five power creature is a Ledger Shredder and Opt is resolving. Yeah, we. I think David really needs to find Galvanic Iteration and Temporal Trespass in just in this game because Chris is getting more and more mana and getting closer and closer to like solving this dungeon. Like you mentioned, that dungeon draws three cards. And Chris is probably really close to actually winning the game, despite it not looking that way right now. Right, absolutely. And that, maybe that's some of the power of the Acerac fair mode thing is, you know, this dungeon having that draw three mode. You know, it's, it's a tough way to do it. But if you do have even just like a little bit of it going on, right, like a little bit of the cost reduction, you can do the dungeon thing for value like we see Chris doing here. And, you know, maybe that's maybe that's good enough some amount of the time. And the Lightning Axe is going to be very aggressively fired off at this Keenan. Do not allow Chris to untap with that. Maybe get some value out of it. Smackdown for five and a pass of the turn. Chris very quickly going to take a draw step here. Yeah, and what you're talking about with the, the value stuff, it might have been in this Ledger Shredder wasn't here. If this was just an Arc Light Phoenix, it would have done a similar amount of damage, but David has kind of connived into some pretty good stuff and been able to keep chaining over and over again uh, something to this interact trophy with. trophy mage? This is trophy mage. So you get to search your deck for a three-cost card. Nice. That, well, that grabs Relic of Legends. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. Kind of a heater. Also grabs the Bontus Monument. I, I don't think he grabs anything from this. Oh, grabs Hearst from the sideboard. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. Wait, I thought it was book. only three. Is it exactly CMC three or is it three or less? Uh, with converted mana, it costs three. Yeah, there we go. So we only uh, have the, the monument and the, the relic. That's okay. Relic's pretty good sure. here, actually. Yeah, so mind. that is dope. Yeah. But Chris, I mean, you can't be super comfortable at 13, right? Like when the Phoenix deck gets to do its thing, it can win a lot of games out of nowhere, bringing multiple birds back, activating things like Hull, you know, of the Storm Giants, which we don't see one yet, to be fair. But things like Temporal Trespass can very quickly flip the script on that. And so you can't feel overly safe, even being at something like 13, with a six-power Ledger Shredder in play, right? Like that, you can't block with your Trophy Mage. And basically that, assembled with just something like a Hall or whatever, is lethal already. So the Phoenix deck... I mean, that's the power of it. That's it can have these extremely explosive turns, and there's a there's a good chance David, with all the the resources he had to work with, the multiple things he's resolved, is going to be able to to get that finished. As we see, Lightning Axe actually pick off the Acerac. No, I'm done with this. <laughs> Stop picking that thing up. <laughs> Just put it in the graveyard. Leave it there. Yeah, and I think Delgado even gets a knife now too. So things are getting out of hand here for Chris. Absolutely. And, I mean, Chris did get the Scry 3 there. We saw in mode number 6. So if he can find another Acerac, he does have that 3-card mode for the final the final piece of that dungeon. Let's see the name of it. Mad Wizard's Lair. Allows you to draw 3 cards, reveal them. You can cast one of them without paying its mana cost. That's That'd be a big game if you can find another Acerac. But he does need another Acerac. And Treasure Cruise number 2 appears to be resolving for David Delgado. And once again, all that interaction David just did, you know, just now we're refueled, ready to go again. Is that a problem, Alliance? We that brought is, it. We brought in the impo You know what? You, your opponents just got like salty card, salty cards, and you're just like, I don't know. Maybe I gotta grind with them. So maybe you bring in just one. You know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm here for. It. I love bringing in one ofs. I mean, especially as a Phoenix deck, you look at so many cards, you'll find it. If it's good, you'll find it. If not, you'll discard the Ledger Shredder. Here, it appears to be good enough. As you see, Improbable Alliance. You draw a second card, you get a one-one fairy for your trouble. Only at works once per turn because uh, you can only draw your second card once per turn. And of course, it has a very expensive mode of looting. I believe that costs seven. I don't know. I never. I believe six so, or yeah. seven. But yeah, it's it's a lot. It's mostly there to do a bitter blossom impression. Mm -hmm. And it does a pretty good one. And you know, sometimes like we saw with the Jesse's match in the round one, you just flood out lands and you just need to activate a little bit. So it's pretty good there. And as we see the uh, amulet come down with a relic, sorry, and an Eldritch evolution on Trophy Mage going to happen post. Relic of Legends. That's pretty big game here because that can go grab Acerac. Eldritch Evolution does say or less. And that gives you the third mode. And I think if Chris assembles a creature 
off of this draw three that makes Acerac cost two less that we have a victory. Something like a Goreclaw. Yeah, I believe so. Or like a cannon, because then you're up a mana on the activation. Although maybe maybe you're a little bit short there because you don't have more. Oh, we have an Urborg implied. One there. No, yeah, Keenan makes mana. So you have like another shot at it or whatever. Yeah, you got, I guess, another look. Yeah, I wonder if we just had to spell pierce there just to like burn two mana. Yeah, the you two know? mana could matter if it's something like a Keenan. Yeah. Yeah. Spell pierce. So it's, it's going to be very interesting. I don't know. This is a really hard spot to be in. And once again, it's one of those things where it's just like, you know, David Delgado is having to figure this stuff out on the fly. Drake, you and I have been in these spots before where you're playing against these decks, and you're just like, I do not know. I guess I'll make sure not to waste a card. You know? Yeah, I'd rather not spend my card on something that doesn't matter and instead try to line my card up with something that matters a little bit more. And we do see we are in Mad Wizard's Lair. Draw three cards, reveal them. What did we hit? Relic of Legends among the mix. A land is a brick. And what is our final card? Can't get a great I think it's look. Prosperous Innkeeper. Prosperous Innkeeper doesn't do it. Does he have another way to draw a card? Make a mana. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and you see David kind of picking up all the cards, trying to figure out, am I am I dead? I'm not dead to this, right? Is this something I need to interact with? And another Lightning Axe answering the Acerac. That's going to do it. Chris Smith going to get defeated mm -hmm. by, is it Phoenix? Piloted by David Delgado. Two games to zero. And uh, the removal spells kind of just proved to be a little too much uh, for Chris Smith's Sultai combo deck. 100%. And that was really exciting. But the only thing more exciting is more Maddox. So we're going to take a quick one-minute break, be right back with more players to watch, and get into our future match here. We'll see you all in just a minute. 